Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's End Tide. Uh, I'm Andrew Houghtonville from the University of New Hampshire. Um, one tip for just a point of interest, uh, the woman that's speaking in the, in the introduction, her name's Melissa Mandrell, and she is related to Barbara Mandrell and the Mandrell sisters. So I think they're cousins. Anyway, so a bit of, of entertainment connection here. So uh, just some Zoom tips. You uh, recall that you can choose the, uh, the speakers that you use, and you can also select to show subtitles or even view the full transcript as, uh, as the captioning is being done. Just a little bit about Entide. It's uh, first Friday of every month. Uh, it coincides with the release of the Entide report, which is a press release. And we, it is a, Entide Lunch and Learn is a joint effort of Kessler Foundation, UNH, and the Association of University Centers on Disability, AUCD. Today's program is going to be a little bit different than our standard program. We're going to do the numbers and we'll have the Entide News, but then we have a roundtable, um, a roundtable of, uh, of interviews with, with artists, and uh, then we'll follow that up with a, uh, a Q&A session. John, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Uh, next slide. Um, the monthly, as Andrew said, in tide is a monthly report. Um, it's a press release with an infographic where we look at the employment statistics. Um, and it uses data from the jobs report, which is um, a product of the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, and uh, it comes out on the first Friday of every month. Next slide. Um, the data is pulled from the current population survey, um, which is fielded, I think, in the early part of the uh, month. Um, and it's the source of the unemployment rate, which the media pays much attention to. Uh, we don't pay much attention to it because it's, uh, it's a statistic that can, uh, uh, it's hard to know um, uh, what, if the unemployment rate goes up or down, it's hard to know why that is uh, the case. Anyway, it is uh, data on civilians aged uh, 16 to 64, not living in institutions. The data has been available since 2008 onward. Uh, that was the year that the Census Bureau added the uh, six disability statistics, um, there are, or six disability questions, I should say. And um, it was a long time getting the, um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the US government to, uh, to agree to add um, uh, some questions about disability. Uh, prior to that, there was only one fairly inept uh, question on disability, and that was the case for a number of years. Um, the data is not seasonally adjusted. Uh, that's why we compare to typically compare to the same year, the same month in the last year. Uh, but since the onset of COVID, we have been focusing primarily on month to month statistics. Uh, so that's what we'll be looking at today. Uh, Andrew, I'll hand it back to you. Okay, great. Thank you, John. I've been told my, my audio is a bit fuzzy. I'll try to be very clear. All right, so we're gonna look at the percentage employed, the employment to population ratio. We're gonna look back to the, around the Great Recession, uh, we see, um, and this goes up until last March, March of 2020, just before the pandemic started to really, uh, really kick off. And so you can see a decline uh, during the Great Recession for people with and without disabilities. You can see people with disabilities were kind of slower to start to recover. Really, you can make an argument that people with disabilities really didn't start to recover until 2016 and 2017. And at that period, we actually saw that this gap between the two lines 
the gap, the employment gap between people with disabilities and without disabilities actually narrow. It was one of the first times that I've ever seen anything like that. Um, and that's when the economy was really at full employment um, and really going, starting to really go strong. Uh, we were still in full employment during March of, uh, during 2018 and 19, um, but the gains really started to flatten out. Uh, for people with disabilities. Now, this brings us up to March, where it was 31.7% for people with disabilities. People without disabilities was 73.5. Yes, I'm getting a note. Don't forget to project. Okay, I will project. So it's 73.5 for people without disabilities. If we add in the first month of the pandemic, when it was really when the shutdown started to occur, uh, the, the employment of people with disabilities dropped from 31.7 to 26.3%. Uh, for people without disabilities, it dropped from 73.5 to 63.2. Percentage point wise, the, the drop was bigger for people without disabilities, but percentage wise as a percentage of the previous month, uh, the jump is actually slightly higher for, or the decline is actually slightly higher for people without, for people with disabilities. So then we're going to add in some successive months. So Ju June, we start to see uh, a real, uh, June and July, we start to see uh, some increase, although it's tapering off for people with disabilities. And really, we see that people with disabilities have really had a slow rise. Uh, by the time we get to the December, this is December, November, December, we start seeing a decline for people without disabilities. Um, and this might be the California shutdown, uh, California and a couple other big states. Uh, we started seeing the uh, results of uh, Thanksgiving um, and uh, the holiday season kicking in. Uh, for January, um, we see another decline for both people with and without disabilities. And here comes the new month. The latest month is February of uh, this past month. Um, and here we see a rise for people without disabilities and a slight rise for people with disabilities. Uh, I've also put in what it looked like last February. Last February. And uh, as you can see, we're still a bit away from last February. There really hasn't been much progress in the last say, boy, almost since, you know, the middle of the summer in the fall, this is the fall period. There really hasn't been much progress for people with disabilities. People without disabilities, the same thing. It's, there's, there's not much progress since the fall. And that could be potentially attributed to the lack of any real progress in terms of the spread until very, very recently. These estimates are for early February. So some of the gains that we've seen recently in the last couple of weeks, don't register this data. The survey is actually fielded in the, uh, basically the second week of February. Uh, so that's the employment to population situation. Uh, you know, the percentage employed, there really hasn't been a lot of progress. It really makes us, uh, you know, we're optimistic that it increased a little bit, but that could be just sampling variation. And, uh, you know, but with the vaccines spreading, you know, the spread of the vaccination program, uh, with the recent decline in cases, uh, we're really hoping to see that this increase a bit. Although I wouldn't expect it to increase until a lot of the uh, the restrictions on certain employment, um, certain economic activities are removed. All right, so that's February. Let's look at the labor force participation rate. The labor force participation rate is uh, the percentage who are employed or the percentage who are employed or on furlough or looking for work. People with disabilities, you can see the effect of the Great Recession for both people with and without disabilities. Um, uh, in March of 2020, before the pandemic, it was at uh, 34.9 for people with disabilities. And here we see the uh, up until this February, so this most recent month. And really why I like to show this graph is it shows that people with disabilities have really been remained active in the labor force over this whole period of time. I think that's a good thing from a social participation perspective. However, it also could be indicating a degree of stress that people with disabilities 
couldn't leave the labor market. They had to either continue looking for work or remain on furlough. Um, and so uh, it's uh, kind of a mixed bag, but I think all in all, I'd rather see it stay the same or increase uh, over the time of the pandemic than, than, stay, than decline like it did for people without the state. So I'm gonna turn it over to Denise. I'm about a minute over, Denise. Uh, take it away. Okay, first slide, Ed. next slide, Andrew. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Denise Roselle. We're going to start, as we always do, with the federal policy update. Um, this is a lot of what I told you I thought was coming last month and didn't come, and so now here we are, still looking at the same things. Um, the COVID relief plan, which is um, working its way through Congress, it has passed the House. It is literally in the Senate right now, and they have a whole ton of amendments that they are working their way through. Uh, it's something called, um, they call it Votorama. That's a, just a Washington insider term because they, in order to get there, they have a ton of amendments they have to vote on. Um, and we'll see what happens. There, there's a lot of stalling tactics going on, et cetera, but ultimately the bill will probably pass. Um, a couple things to know about it. First one is there is nine point, still knock on wood, there is $9.3 billion in there in an FMAP bump. bump. In other words, more money for home and community-based services under Medicaid. That's going to be a big deal for keeping people living in the community. Um, and if you want to do any calling to your member of Congress today, call your senators and tell them that you really appreciate the fact that it's in there and you want it to stay. Um, we don't. We are not hearing that it's going anywhere. I will tell you at the moment, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't be reinforcing it. Um, another thing about that's in the bill, I've talked to you before about the raise the, about minimum wage increases and that kind of stuff. That is not in the bill. It's in the House bill. It is not likely to be in the set. It's not going to be in the Senate bill because the parliamentarian said they couldn't put it in um, to go through this budget reconciliation process. Believe me, you don't want to get in the weeds on that. The bottom line is it's not in there. So we will be having a conversation later on raise the wage, minimum rate, wage increases, which also includes for this community, the doing away of some minimum wage. So that will come later on. It's not gonna come in this bill. Um, there is um, There will be $1,400 payments going out to um, adults earning at $75,000 or under. And then it's scaled between 75 and $80,000, it's scaled. The important thing to know about that is that this time, it will go to everyone, meaning including adult dependents, as long as you meet the income requirements. The past payments that have gone out have not done that. So that's a big win for the disability community. Um, I, so, and I anticipate we will see, um, Senator Schumer in the Senate says that we will see this bill finished before the end of the weekend. Um, we'll see. They may, to do that, they probably have to be there for all night, but we'll see how that goes. Um, I want to raise, uh, last time I talked a little bit about the apprenticeship bill. It's HR 447. It was introduced by um, Representative Bobby Scott of Virginia. Uh, there's some really nice language in it around disability. So it's an important bill. It passed the House. It has now gone to the Senate. Uh, if you want to look at something that's kind of interesting, might give us some other um, opportunities um, that's one of them. And we're also looking in the Senate and making, there is some nice disability language in it, but we are also looking in the Senate to add some additional disability language. So we'll be talking more about that. Um, I do want to highlight one other thing on vaccines. I'm looking for my language here. Yesterday, literally yesterday, CDC came out with some additional language on um, folks with disabilities. And we've been asking for this for quite some time. So I want to make sure I literally read the language to you because it's important. Um, it's what it says is consider under sections phases 1B and 1C, right? So all of the vaccines are in phases. Under 1B and 1C, it specifically says that subprioritization may also be necessary among other groups. Jurisdictions, here's the important language, jurisdictions should consider the unique needs of residents, such as people with disabilities or cognitive decline and their caregivers, as well as those with limited access to technology when evaluating vac vaccination location accessibility, communicating vaccine information and scheduling appointments. Um, the community has been pushing for this language for a long time because there's a lot going on out there in trying to get vaccines to people, particularly making accessible 
uh, making vaccine locations accessible. So um, I will stick the link to this language in the chat when I'm done talking. Um, okay, next slide, Andrew. That's the federal stuff. Now I wanna bring a few things to your attention. Um, I don't know about you, but everyone I talk to has been looking for all kinds of research, outcomes, data, anything on um, COVID, the effect of COVID and employment and people with disabilities. Andrew and the folks at Kessler and UNH have been bringing us the statistics, but they're looking for the effect on the employment itself um, in uh, beyond the statistics. And Journal of Vogue Rehab has a special issue that just came out in pre-issue form, pre-publication form, I think that's what they call it. The entire issue is on this topic. I did not, I'm not gonna talk about each of these articles, but there's a bunch of articles you can see you know, resilience of employees with intellectual and developmental disabilities during COVID, um, you know, understand the impact of isolation on employment, uh, reframing workforce inclusion through the lens of universal design and COVID. So I think this, there's some really good um, articles in here. And for those of you looking for information, here it is. Uh-oh, there weren't my slides. Okay, Andrew, I'll just keep talking. Um, there's a, the next slide, which you can't see at the moment. Um, but you will, these will all be available afterwards. Um, NCSL, the National Conference of State Legislatures, also has uh, a new piece out on the pandemic's effect on the economy and workers. Um, so this one is interesting too. There's also one out from the Council of State Governments. And I'm giving you in the slide, which you'll have to look at later, um, I'm giving you both the NCSL report and the Council of State Governments report. Uh, the Council of State Governments is on the future of the workforce, and the NCSL one is on effects of the pandemic, and it specifically is talking about the effect of telework and digital services and moving toward virtual commerce and what that may mean for people with disabilities, and it gives some very specific federal and state um, activities that are happening as well as recommendations. So that's that one. Um, I'm assuming we still don't have, I'm not seeing slides at least, so I'll keep going. Um, Earn, our friends at Earn, have a, and they have updated their website. So again, the link is there for the website. They have all kinds of stuff up there around employment. Earn is a ODEP, Office of Disability Employment Programs um, piece uh, funded project that has all kinds of stuff around work and people with disabilities. So it's got a whole list of, it's got COVID response employers, it's got um, COVID, ADA, how laws apply, um, everything, EEO, ADA, Rehab Act. Oh, there we go. That's the earn one. Thank you very much. Um, wow. All kinds of federal resources. So you'll be able to see those as well. And it, they've updated their resource page is the point. It's really well done. Next slide, please, Andrew. Um, the next one, WIOA, there's Mathematica has been in charge of the WIOA implementation study. And they've got some findings and new products that they've just put out on um, what, what's, what are you seeing? What are we seeing on WIOA and implementation on Workforce Investment and Opportunity Act? And that's where VR fits, as well as a variety of other services. Um, the American Job Centers, all of that is in WIOA. So uh, they're beginning to see some things like, you know, better partnerships, which is great. Um, greater efforts at cross-training, again, for folks with disabilities, greater trust cross-training in the AJCs is really important. Um, you know, integration of employer services, all of that is exactly what Congress hoped to see when VR was put in under the Workforce Investment and Opportunity Act, WIOA, along with all the other job training programs. Um, so it'll be interesting, and I, I send you to that one. Uh, next slide, Andrew. Um, assistive Technology Toolkit, this is from AT3, the National Assistive Technology Act TA Center, and I'm not sure I have, I've highlighted them much in the past, so I gave you the website for the center itself as well as their new Assistive Technology Toolkit. What I like about this in particular is that it has a whole section on developing a funding strategy. I think so often when we talk about assistive technology, we talk about, um, you know, what is it and what do you need to provide? And, you know, I think most organizations outside the disability world, at least, and corporations look at AT needs when somebody walks in the door who needs them, as opposed to having a funding strategy for anyone who needs them across time. 
So I was really pleased to see that this one has something specific on developing a funding strategy. And then it's just a really straightforward toolkit about what is assistive technology. It's stuff that most of the folks on this call are gonna know already, but to have in your toolkit when you're going, in your toolkit, when you're going to talk to employers, I think this would be really, and other organizations, I think would be really nice. It gives you a lot of very basic information as well as, um, some important additional information. Collaboration planning is another one that's in there that I thought was really good. You know, what things are available in your state that you can look for on AT that are publicly funded, um, as well as trying to plan for your own funding strategy, because not everything's going to be publicly funded, as we all know. Okay, next slide, Andrew. Um, from our friends at JAN, the Job Accommodations Network, they have a new training module out on disclosing a disability in the workplace. Um, this one's also really nice, I thought, because it includes a variety of types of uh, materials. So there's a, there's a couple of videos, for instance, that show you um, how an applicant is making a decision about disclosing. Um, it gave some, as the lawyer in me really likes the idea that it gave some ideas for how to deal with people who, you know, when you get an illegal medical question, they can't ask you that question. Here's how you can deal with that. And I thought that was really nice, too. Um, gaps in how do you deal with gaps in employment and disclosure? So it shows your gap in employment on your on your resume for a year or two, and that actually you know that that was because of a disability, and you don't necessarily want to disclose that disability in the workplace. So how do you make that decision? So it gives all kinds of ideas and information about how to make an educated decision about disclosure. Um, and as we know, Jan always does really good work. So we we're I was pleased to see that coming out from them. Uh, next one, Andrew, a couple webinars. Um, our friends at Kessler have another one of their symposiums on artificial intelligence coming up. And um, this is the information for it. It's March 16th. The link is there for how to sign up. This is about screening, hiring, and onboarding using AI. And as we can probably all imagine, that often has a bias in hiring against people with disabilities and other marginalized populations because of the AI that they're using and how they're using it. So the first thing is to better understand that so you know how it's happening. But then looking at, you know, understanding what are the risks and opportunities of that and what types of jobs are being used for that and how do you prepare and use the technology successfully in online interviewing so that um, it isn't um, leading to the same kinds of bias in hiring that we've seen in the past. So this is from the folks at Kessler. And then the other one I wanted to pull up, Andrew, next slide, is um, on employment. And this one is, again, anytime I see anything on employment, people with disabilities and COVID, I think it's important to really highlight that. So this one is from the Employment First Community of Practice. Um, and this one is March 10th. The link, again, is in the slides. It'll be available afterwards. Um, and they're going to be sharing results from ODEP, um, Office of Disability Employment Programs, um, October National Dialogue on providing employment services to people with disabilities during the pandemic. So addressing issues and solutions to competitive integrated employment during the pandemic, um, themes like you know, reasonable accommodations, workforce accommodations, risk assessment, shifting labor markets, safety, obviously, telework, obviously. So I thought this one was gonna be an interesting one as well. And um, to hear what ODEP heard, and then to have some analysis of that, I think is gonna be really good. I think that is my last slide, Andrew. Why don't you flip? Yeah, and I get to introduce Betty and then she's gonna take it away and introduce the folks at our round table. So as we continue in our disability in the arts theme that we've been running for several months now, I'd like to introduce Betty Siegel from the Kennedy Center. Um, Betty directs the Office of Accessibility as well as the VSA Emerging Young Artists Program uh, for artists with disabilities. She champions, defends, and leads national and international disability arts education and cultural practices. Today, she brings three alumni of the VSA program, whom you're going to meet soon, and I'm going to toss it to Betty now. Great. Thank you so much for having us here today. It really is a, a great pleasure. So I'm going to jump right in and kind of give us a little bit of context to why this conversation today, why these artists today. I know from experience that many employment professionals frequently consider careers in the arts to be 
a little bit frivolous and really a non-viable career path. However, the reality is that opportunities in arts-based careers are pretty endless. And if you dig down, you'll find that many of the jobs and careers employment pathways are based in an arts foundation. At the Kenny Center, we start the process of developing our young artists in K-12 schools, colleges and universities and community spaces, because we believe that education equity is a foundation and critical to making individuals with disabilities competitive in arts employment. Now, my personal interest is in ensuring civil, human and cultural rights. The CRPD embeds cultural rights as a core and fundamental concept for individuals with disabilities. And the Kennedy Center aims to elevate the representation of people with the lived experience of disability and acknowledge that their contributions are centered in our work. One way we do that, of course, is through our career tra trajectory projects that's really hard to say. The Emerging Young Artists Program, International Young Soloists, and Playwright Discovery pro um, Programs. And shameless promotion, at the very end of this, there will be a slide that gives you some of the links to those programs, which are currently open, and we are currently seeking applications from our next cohort of young artists. But that leads me to really what I want to get to today, which is I have the honor of introducing, and then I'm going to lead a little bit of an interview with three alumni from our career and art space program. So I'm thrilled to introduce, if we could get to the next slide, Paul Gavin. Paul is a musician. He is an alumni of the International Young Soloist Program. He is a teacher, a composer, and arranger in Tampa, Florida. Um, since graduating from the University of South Florida in 2015, Paul has made his living exclusively as a freelance musician. And I'm going to let him talk more about his work, but I think that one of the reasons why I brought Paul in is that he is a successful uh, artist in the community today. Um, our next person, next slide, is Michelle Miles. Michelle is um, a multimedia artist, and her work is informed and is conceptually underpinned by her experience as a disabled woman. And she recently held a year-long position in accessibility at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and is now studying design and innovation in digital accessibility. Um, so I think she is also an exemplary um, person to look at when we look at how people flow through different elements of the arts to develop and build their careers. My last artist today is, next slide, Oakley Thiel. Oakley is uh, a visual artist, a public speaker, and a disability rights advocate whose work centers on invisible chronic illness. And she says the intimate bond she has formed with her medical alert service dog. Um, what I think is exciting and that I'm hoping Oakley will talk about today is her project with DisArts out of Michigan, um, where she has created a pandemic focused project called My Dearest Friend to give voices uh, to disabled people through, through this time. So I don't wanna talk anymore. I really would like my three artists to come online. And if you could turn on your, your videos and your uh, mics, I'm gonna ask them some questions. And then I'm hoping that this will inspire some of you in the audience today also to ask questions because I can't think of three people I'd rather do this with. So welcome you guys, thanks for being here. I'm going to start with asking Oakley a question. So Oakley, you're on the spot. <laughs> so tell me, what helped you most in pursuing your own career path? Where, where has it led you? What are you doing today? Do you have any plans post-COVID? Yeah, so my name is Oakley Thiele. Um, I'm a white female with short brown hair. I'm wearing a blue artist apron. I have gray gloves, and I'm sitting in front of a white uh, wall. Um, so to answer Betty's question, um, I'm not just an artist, I'm a disabled artist. And I think it's really important to make that distinction because my disability has had such an impact, uh, such a positive impact on my work. And it's been really instrumental in propelling my career forward. Um, you see, as young disabled people, we know this world wasn't built for us. We live in this inaccessible and ableist society that continually disregards the value of disabled lives and the disabled perspective and 
as a result, disabled people are forced to build up their own communities, their own space, be it in person or virtual, uh, where we can exist freely and unapologetically. Um, so there's this deep running sense of camaraderie amongst the disability community. And as a young disabled creative who is trying to find my footing in the arts industry, I have received all kinds of support, be it emotional support, financial support, career advice from so many established uh, disabled professionals who quite literally just want to see the young disabled creatives of today succeed. Um, so as Betty mentioned, I am an alumni of the VSA Emerging Young Artist Program at the Kennedy Center. Um, this program completely changed my career and my life. Um, for those of you who don't know what the program is, uh, the Kennedy Center flew me out uh, along with several other artists to DC for development workshops and an exhibition opening. Um, and I remember very clearly that that was the first time meeting other disabled artists like myself and the first time that I felt a sense of pride uh, towards my disability. And so after leaving that program, I very intentionally integrated uh, disability and advocacy um, into my work. And that's really propelled my career forward in ways that I never thought possible. Um, I have since gone on to work uh, with DISART, a arts and cultural nonprofit based out of Grand Rapids, Michigan on the Dearest Friends Project. Uh, the Dearest Friends Project is a COVID-19 art collaboration that has managed to reach a global scale. We collect uh, personal stories from disabled people around the world. Um, and after which I illustrate each one, we sort of create this digital archive. Um, it's our way of archiving the disabled experience during this pandemic and giving voice to uh, people with minority uh, groups. Um, I've also been publicly speaking for several for a year now about art and disability. I've co-founded several grassroots art productions with young advocates. Um, so what I'm trying to say here in, in many words is that there are so many possibilities when it comes to working as a young disabled creative. I have chosen this marriage of art and advocacy and public speaking. So it's hard to say where I really plan to go in the future, except that I want to continue on this path. And there are many programs like the Kennedy Center and DISART and even individual uh, disabled advocates who are so readily available for support. Um, the disability community is so powerful um, and all the support from the community, uh, that's really what's been helping me most as I pursue this career. Um, I'll be sure I'll drop those links to the project actually in the chat now, but yeah. Oakley, wow. <laughs> wow, what a kickoff. That's a great way to start. So many thoughts in there that I want to follow up on, but I'm going to move us along because I want to hear every voice today. So Michelle, you're going to be next. I'm, I'm curious about, you're pretty upfront in your bio. You say I'm a disabled woman. You're pretty upfront with who you are and what your identity is. So did your having a disability affect your career path? You know, did it provide opportunities or did it provide barriers? Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Absolutely, thank you, Betty. Hi, everyone, my name is Michelle. Um, I am a white female with long brown hair, sitting in a room with cream colored walls with a bookshelf behind me and it's not pictured in the frame, but I'm sitting in a power wheelchair. And I wanna thank you, Oakley, for kicking us off with um, setting that standard of verbal description. And also, I just wanna um, emphasize everything you said about the power of the disabled community, disability community, and, um, and, and also say that being taken under the wing of the disability community has really transformed me and my work as well. Um, but to answer your question, Betty, yes. Um, I think having a disability has 100% informed everything about my life and what I've chosen to do. And, um, and particularly you mentioned um, the barriers. I think what I've reflected on and I haven't always known, but I think what I've come to understand about my sort of trajectory as an artist and a professional is that um, the barriers that I've faced in having a disability have always become opportunities for me to both further my artistic practice and my professional pursuits. Um, and it, I think it makes sense if I explain a little bit about my trajectory. So I'm just gonna walk you through my life. Um, I, I started off very young as a painter and a visual artist interested in paper mediums. Um, but as my disease progressed, it became more difficult for me to use pen and paper or pencils and paintbrushes. And so I didn't think that I had a future as a painter or um, a visual artist in that way. So I transitioned into photography 
And from there, I kind of discovered the realm of film and that's really what I pursued throughout college. But even within the realm of film, I found that a lot of the tools that I was using were really inaccessible. Um, carrying heavy cameras and following actors through spaces that were inaccessible just weren't things that I could do that my peers around me were doing. So I've, I kind of um, reassessed the materials I was working with and scaled everything down to, um, to sort of smaller, more accessible sets. And I started um, experimenting with paint and using Petri dishes and filming in a, in a sort of macro style, um, kind of drawing on my roots as a painter as well. And had a lot of success with that. My work um, has been shown in lots of places that I never believed it would from just experimenting with materials that I was struggling to use and finding adaptive ways of using them. And, um, and that was kind of a transformative moment for me to realize the power of, um, of really tapping into the barriers that I was experiencing and using those, um, those parameters that I was met with as kind of a catalyst for jumping off into um, pushing my work in creative ways. And so um, after I graduated from college, I really wanted to move to New York. And I also really wanted to kind of continue studying this intersection of my identity as a disabled person and my identity as an artist. And I was very, very, very lucky to find a almost perfect position for me at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and even luckier that they accepted me for the position. Um, so I spent the year with the ACCESS team um, where we would put together programs for visitors with disabilities to come to the museum and experience the art at the museum in ways that use visual information, scent information, auditory information, and really just kind of expand the possibilities for interacting with art. And I think for me, that was really, that's really informed my practice as an artist, um, not only my kind of direction professionally, and I don't really distinguish between the two. I think that everything that I do informs my work as an artist. Um, so once the pandemic happened, um, everything shifted to the virtual space and the museum closed obviously, and my position was a year long. So it ended right around that time. And, um, and I kind of, developed an interest in shifting to the virtual space as well. And, um, and kind of the, the final um, moment in my career trajectory as of late was um, last year I was contacted by Adobe to um, participate in a usability study um, for a product that they were developing for using um, a canvas based product, which is like Photoshop, for example, through only using a keyboard. So not having to use a mouse or um, other tools and for someone with limited dexterity and hand weakness that was really exciting because Photoshop is something I've been using to do my work for years and years um, and so I did that study and I decided that I wanted to be on the team of people who did the study so I applied to a design program um, and received a scholarship to do it which I'm currently in right now I'm on my lunch break and um, and I'm currently interviewing for positions at Adobe doing design work so um, so now I'm kind of pursuing this path of learning about um, how to make tools more accessible for people who want to make art. That's, wow. Ha! That's great, Michelle. I, I am really fascinated by the way that we adapt and move through space and time and to our careers. And that a career doesn't have to just always be one focus, that you can make changes and shifts and you reach that fork in the road and you make a decision and your career goes a different way. But it's always, your career is always foundationally, it sounds like gonna be rooted in the arts. Now, our last speaker today is uh, Paul Gavin. Paul is a musician and I'm hoping you can step us through the following question. Oh, yeah. Because I also know that you're a teacher. You've been an educator. I, I know you've come back and talked to our alumni group. And so what advice would you give to young emerging artists or young emerging musicians with disabilities who are passionate about pursuing an arts-based career? What would, what would you tell them today? 
Absolutely. First, um, my goodness, uh, Oakley and Michelle, I just honor y'all and I'm so like, I feel fortunate to even be in y'all's presence uh, <laughs> to hear what y'all have been up to and what you've accomplished. I just, oh my goodness, wow. Uh, I'm a black man. I've got no hair on my head. I've got a pretty nice goatee on my face. I'm in a room with a gray futon slash couch situation and the walls are cream colored. Uh, and I, I'm super honored to be here. Um, yeah, so, so the question, what would my advice be? Um, I guess maybe before I do that, I should say a little bit about what I've been up to. So I'm a, I'm a drum set player um, and also a percussionist. Um, and that's what I do for a living. I play, write, and teach music for a living. Um, I play private events. I play big concert halls. I play little teeny restaurants and everything in between. Um, I teach private lessons to all kinds of students. Um, and I play the drums with kids that have disability, like uh, djembes, the African drums from West Africa, different styles of those. I play those with kids that have disabilities um, in senior centers, um, after school programs, and anything in, in between. There's nobody that we don't play the drums with. I work with a group, uh, group called Giving Tree Music. So that's a little bit of uh, what I do. Um, as far as my advice for someone who is interested in doing this for a career, the the first thing I would say is the, the advice I always give anyone is find 10 people doing what you like or what you're interested in doing and ask them a lot of questions. So whatever lane you're kind of curious about, you should deeply research that there is the, in my humble opinion, there's nothing more important and more uh, key to what you're going to do as far as your happiness in life is concerned and what you find yourself doing in work, just because of the time factor. There's nothing else you're gonna do in your life more than you're gonna do whatever your job is gonna be, uh, if you're gonna be an employed person. So it's just key to find something that's gonna be congruent with who you are as a person and what you're made up of. Um, and you know the people who are rude to waitresses and waiters and the people who are uh, mean to service workers, those are the people that don't like their jobs very much. Um, and so it's just so important to find something that's congruent with who you are as a person that lines up with your character and what you care about. Uh, and that feeds into your soul. Find that and do that. Um, the only way you're going to know that without uh, doing a lot more experimentation than is necessary is by asking people who are already in the field. So I always recommend people find people who are in the field that the fields that they're interested in or adjacent fields and learn every single thing you possibly can from them. Uh, the next thing I would say is ask for help. Um, be someone who is willing to accept help. There are no, there is no such thing as a self-made person. Uh, that's a lie. Anyone who claims that they're a self-made person is not being honest about the help that they have received in their past. Um, and so I strongly encourage, you know, ask for help. The biggest help I have is my wife. She's the best woman in the world. I don't deserve her. She's far better than I deserve. Um, and she helps me in so many ways. Um, I've received private lessons for much less than the person who gave them to me deserved. And I try to pass that on as best that I can. Um, I've been given opportunities that could have been given to someone else who was more qualified, but someone gave me my very first opportunity, my second opportunity, uh, my first opportunity does doing something at a high level, help high level, and I got those opportunities to prove myself. And from getting those opportunities to prove myself, more opportunities came. Um, and so I don't look back on those things and say, look at what I did. I say, thank goodness for the help that I received. Um, and so for those of us who have accomplished anything, be, be a helper. Find someone to be helpful to them and look back on the things that you were given as help. Let that be a motivator to be helpful. Um, so find, find, find a crew, find a community, get some people around you that'll, that'll push you up, that'll raise, raise the roof when you do something well, that'll pat you on the back, that'll pick you up if you fall down, find some people that'll get behind you and help you out. Um, and then be that person when you get the opportunity to later on. Kind of a more practical thing um, is like know the what should i say know, know the atmosphere that you exist in um so we in the united states uh as a society we appreciate the arts but we don't value them um what we do value is big businesses we value business um we value things that can uh, have ta tax documents attached to them and things like that that's what we value so so register yourself as a self-employed person, have an LLC um, or be a nonprofit and be registered and be on paper so someone who doesn't speak our language can, can 
uh, appraise your value in their language uh, rather than appraise your value in your own language, which they don't understand. Um, if I had not been registered as an LLC before COVID hit, I would not have been able to get the payroll protection program. Um, and I don't know where I would, me and my wife would be right now, but we were able to get that. And that's because I was registered and I was legit to the legit people. Um, so, so, so know things like that. Be capable of speaking the language of people uh, who have power over your, uh, your success um, and be able to communicate in the way that they communicate. And that'll make a really, really big difference. Um, wow. Other than that, I hope you find something that you enjoy and do that because that's just everything. There you go. That's my answer. <laughs> That, that's a great answer. I, you know what's so frustrating about today? So I just have to put a shout out to the Kessler Foundation and the folks who organized this. We needed a lot more time for this conversation because I think, um, Andrew, I actually think we're out of time to ask any more questions, but no, 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 nobody, not, none of us did anything wrong. <laughs> we were, we did it right. It's Andrew's fault. Yeah, and that's she right. did not leave fault. enough time for us. So I do wonder if there are any questions for us or Well, I think I think if we could probably um I think we could probably give a couple a few more minutes. Maybe why don't we give you guys 10 okay. more minutes and mm -hmm. if you want to open up ask them all all three a one question and then have them yeah. give a two minute response. Well, yeah, do you guys are you uh, prepared to answer another question or should I just wing it or do you guys want to ask each other questions? I'm here to serve. Let's go. Okay. So, um you because this is um we're looking at employment for people with disabilities, I'm sort of focusing in a little more tightly on on your disabilities. Um what today, there's lots of challenges. You all mentioned COVID. We all know that's a reality, but we're going to come out of that at some point. How, what do you see as the future trends in employment for um, young people with disabilities who do want to pursue these different kinds of arts-based careers? We've got policy people here. Is it, is it policy? Is it education? Is it something intangible? Give you guys a minute to think about that. So what challenges are there for, I mean, like, first of all, I want to learn from my youngers and I should have described myself. So I am a white woman with black hair and a white shock and red glasses in a room with a bookcase and a yellow ducky behind me. Um, but yeah, what, what do you think are going to be the challenges for the artists coming behind you? Um, I'll just go ahead and yeah, I'll, I'll hop in. Um, the ex the challenge that we're experiencing a lot in the music world, at least, uh, has a lot to do with copyright law, um, the protection of intellectual property. Um, the internet is still the wild, wild west, um, which in a lot of ways is is great. Education and information has never been more accessible, uh, but the result is a lot of art is consumed on the internet. Um, and is easily propagated on the internet. And so the results of that um, are often that intellectual property gets given away for free when it shouldn't be. Um, I, I, I was one of the people that unknowingly participated in doing the wrong thing. I, I, I did the LimeWire and Napster thing when I was in high school and I didn't know that I was doing the wrong thing. But actually that's stealing and I stole things from people and I still feel bad about that. Um, so protecting those intellectual property rights um, is going to make a huge difference. I know that affects Great. the visual arts world a lot as well. Great. So Oakley or Michelle, what do you what do you think the challenges are going to be? Um, Oakley? Yeah, I mean, I don't know about the challenges for tomorrow. I know the challenges for today. I mean, okay. even just like, as I said in the speech, like, this whole world is inaccessible for us. Um, even I'm having trouble sort of exhibiting in galleries. I have to talk to them constantly about, you know, things need to be closed captions. I need you to put image descriptions and things. Um, and it's just this uphill battle of trying to explain how to make things um, accessible for um, our audiences, I guess. Um, but it's, um, it's an uphill battle. Um, I think it's difficult where organizations i'm specifically i guess i'm speaking more in the art world right now but i think you know they really value aesthetics over accessibility 
Um, and that's really been sort of causing a lot of issues for us, for sure. Great. Michelle, do you have something you want to add? Yeah. Um, the, both of those answers are great, and thank you for sharing them. Um, and I think that one, that point you mentioned just now, Oakley, the aesthetics versus accessibility and the fact that it has to be a, a battle, I think they can coexist so beautifully. Um, but, but I think um, one thing that has really just been a conversation between me and uh, some friends of mine in the community this week has been um, uh, healthcare and navigating not only um, finding healthcare when you are freelance um, or, or living off of your work, but, um, but just understanding um, how to navigate that system. And um, mm -hmm. a friend of mine were both nominated for a grant this past week. Uh, well, we were nominated mm -hmm. and we won the grant and, um, and it was really yeah. exciting. I know it's so exciting, but she told me, I have no idea how to accept this money because I'll lose my health insurance. And so then she spent yeah. a whole week of her time trying to um, trying to figure out how, how to do that. And luckily she has landed a solution, but it took a week of her time. And um, as disabled artists, we don't always have that, that time and that energy to, to just find the resources to help us understand how to navigate a system. Um, so I think that that's something that, that definitely I, I, is something I'm still facing today, trying to figure out how to put all of my pieces in order to make sure that I'm covered um, with my health and 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 have the energy to do that and still pursue my work and and my professional career. Really amazing points, um, Andrew. Kaboom! I think we just blew up your your field there. Well, I you know a lot of these are 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 similar to what what other occupations, but I think that the you know, uh, the big thing that, that I take away from what all of you have said is the bit, one of the things is the business of doing it. Uh, you know, as, as Paul, as you said, uh, setting up an LLC, um, managing health insurance benefits, uh, managing income levels, because many, many people, especially younger individuals who are coming out of college and, um, coming, you know, into, uh, you know, transitioning, um, that managing uh, Social Security benefits, if, if people are participating in Social Security, uh, getting a windfall of a scholarship shouldn't, you know, there should be easy ways that it doesn't take a week to figure out, right, uh, that benefits planning part of it. And um, I know that people at the Social Security Administration, at uh, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare, uh, are aware of these things, but they're just so complicated. And and I hear you managing healthcare, managing insurance, managing an LLC. Um, they're a bit mystifying. Uh, and I really like Paul your idea of contacting ten people um, for for a lot of reasons. One is among those ten people, you might find somebody that has managed the health insurance issues of a small uh, business. Um, there might be uh, someone who has fought with uh, a gallery uh, about accessibility because many galleries are in older buildings that are not accessible physically. Um, uh, you know, I think you all are, are really champions of things that need to be done better. You guys, you know, the successes, but also the battles that you fought are really something that the policymakers and the academics uh, need to embrace as very specific barriers. Um, I know that there's been work in these areas policy-wise, but it's just never come to fruition. Um, yeah. it, it adds more complexity a lot of times with the policy stuff uh, rather than, than remove uh, complexity. You know, one of the things that I also want to point out is that I was hearing throughout all three of these is, um, is is the advocacy that I think artists have to do for themselves anyways is really intense. And then you layer on the disability and the advocacy right. you have to do as a person with a disability then in the art space. And I think Paul, you were getting to this idea of the ecosystem that we live in, be aware of this ecosystem. Um, you know, 
being that advocate as Oakley has been talking about, like I have to go to the gallery and I have to advocate for these needs. And I'm advocating not only for myself, but for my, for my audience. Um, and Michelle was working at the Museum of Metropolitan Art where basically that's what they were doing also advocating. Yeah. These are challenging systematic issues that it would be great if policy could address. Yeah. And um, I'm, I, I just think that it's interesting to hear this whole conversation in light of your audience that we're talking to today, which are the people that are going to make or break, I think, employment for artists with disabilities. Yeah. Um, do you guys have, do you have, have something you want to add? I don't want to be talking. Yeah, so. let's do a final round of comments from, from you guys the speakers. Uh, you know, there, there are some questions coming in a QA. and a uh, they are uh, a lot of accolades and some some interesting information on Medicaid and Medicare um, and some of the some of the programs. But a lot of these programs sometimes can be hidden, and and it takes a week to find out the the rules and stuff. So why don't we just do uh, spend the last four minutes getting a roundup and then we'll we'll say goodbye. We can also right. do follow up Q and A uh, if people on the the audience members have questions of the of the three. Yeah. So, do you guys? Um, I think what it comes down to is: do you, anything that you heard today from each other, um, from Andrew? Any thoughts that you want to make sure this audience uh, knows before they leave this webinar? Last minute comments. I just want to again uh, honor the amazing work of Oakley and Michelle that I just learned about. My goodness, like I look yeah. forward to seeing what else y'all do. Super cool, super cool. My goodness, and I and I've learned from both of you as well things that I can do better. So thank you for being awesome. That's great, Oakley. Right back at you, Paul. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, just thank you for having us, um, and uh, this was a great conversation. So thank you guys. Great. Yes, I would just echo the sentiment. You guys are amazing and I'm honored to share this virtual space with you. And I think this is just a live demonstration on the power of community. Very much so. Hey, Andrew, can I jump in for one second? You Only betcha. Because one of the questions that came in kind of ties into a lot of things we've been talking about. Um, somebody was asked, and I answered it privately, but let's just do it here too. Um, somebody asked if the $1,400 that is coming out from the federal government to those earning less than $75,000, if it will count, um, how it will count in terms of folks' income, because obviously $1,400 could really screw up somebody's income for purposes of, of disability. So anyway, my understanding is that it will not count against SSI or SSDI. So, you know, that's, that's a big deal. Uh, but and for fourteen hundred dollars, that's a big deal. So um, that is my understanding of what's in the bill. Now we'll and, out, but that's my understanding. And that does tie back to Michelle's point that her exactly experienced, which is that the, yep. in the world of the arts and culture, you get grants. You you know you apply for these grants, you work hard to get them. They're yeah. not always big grants. They are sometimes smaller grants, but they empower you to do your work. Yep. You know, they yep. let you buy your paint. They let you pay your rent. And, in, in, and it is a shameful society that allows um, that, like that puts an artist or a human being in a position where they have to choose, do I take this grant or, or lose my health insurance and my that's right. disability insurance? That, Absolutely that's right. not okay. Absolutely I've often right. said that I have two friends that are PhD economists and to manage their daughter's Medicaid uh, and Medicare takes, takes both of them. It's a, it's a yeah. Um, all right. Well, thank you all very much. We're right, right at our time. I just want to, to just point out that it's really, really great to hear all of your stories, and I, I wish you all the success in the future. But it also, for me, uh, as an economist, we'll say that 70% of all jobs are found by networking, by family and personal networking. And Paul, your statement about talk to 10 people, um, you know, I think that that, that building of networking uh, is really where a lot of a lot of us, I, me personally, have built our careers based off the people we know. John O'Neill is a great example. I met John in a little conference, and uh, he ended up helping me reestablish my career after a, a, a slight mishap, so a big mishap. But uh, anyway, so um, 
anyway, thanks everybody. Thank you, Betty. Uh, thank everybody for all, all your work. I didn't get a chance to do the shameless promotion slide. Um, uh, let me put it up there really quick, uh, super quick. Do the shameless promotion, share. Go to www.kennedy-center.org. Tell all your young artists to apply. Um, speaking of yes. getting uh, support, these all come with cash awards. Yeah, so what um, does VSA stand for? Oh, it doesn't stand for anything. It's just like IBM and ARC. We are, oh, okay. um, we are the Office of Accessibility in VSA, and we honor and respect our founder, Ambassador Jean Kennedy Smith, by retaining yeah. the VSNA of our name. Sounds good. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all very much. Have a good afternoon. Have a good weekend. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye, y'all. Bye,